Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is John Archidiacono. I'm president and CEO of the Health Museum. Um, you probably were expecting Becky Seabrook, who was supposed to moderate the, the conversation, but unfortunately she's not able to today, so I'm filling in. Um, but I'm very excited to welcome you today to the second webinar of our eight-part series with the Menninger Clinic. The series is all about parents, let's talk about mental health. This is a collaboration with the nationally recognized Menninger Clinic. It's all about helping parents and care caregivers understand the importance of mental health and their children. Mental health is always an important topic, but today it is even more relevant. In light of the pandemic, we all are talking about mental health. We're all aware about mental health and we're all needing um, care around our mental health. So um, really, really, really important topic. I'd be surprised if you haven't heard of Menger Clinic, but if you haven't, let me tell you about it. Menger Clinic is to mental health what MD Anderson is to cancer. US News has ranked Menninger in the top 10 psychiatric hospitals for 31 consecutive years. It was founded 96 years ago in Kansas and moved to Houston in 2003 to work with Baylor College of Medicine in advancing the standard of mental health care through innovative treatment, research, and training programs. So let's get started. Without further ado, today's topic is about the brain and mental health. The brain makes up about 2% of your child's body, but it manages 100% of his or her thoughts, emotions, behaviors, decision-making, and learning. This is all about the dynamic connection between brain function and mental health. I'm happy to welcome Dr. John Stevens, our presenter. Dr. Stevens is the Medical Director of Outpatient Services and Admissions, as well as the Vice President of Growth and Innovation at Menninger Clinic. He's a physician and board certified in adult, as well as, as, well as child and adolescent psychi psychi psychiatry. Dr. Stevens came to Menninger in 2015 to relaunch outpatient services at the clinic. He and his team have built an array of innovative programs to serve patients in the community and even in their own homes. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stevens. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for the Health Museum. It's great to be here to be uh, number two behind Angela Kareth, who was here last week, and to talk about an interesting topic. I'm going to sh share my slides. Hopefully, everyone could see that now. Yep. Oh, can, can you see, see that? Slide. Thank you. Super. So I want to talk about the brain and mental health. John, thank you for that warm introduction. And um, I, I love what the, the Health Science Museum is doing. I think it's next week. The brain, the world inside your head is opening. And I hope that this kind of um, kind of introduces the topic of brain and mental health. And if you want to know more, see more about the brain, it sounds like a really interesting exhibit that's opening at the Health Museum. So I encourage everyone to check it out. I will be there. Uh, we might talk about a lot of things today. I'm going to talk about two psychiatric conditions in depth. And I might talk, I'm going to talk about a new treatment that's available that you might not have heard of. Uh, we might talk about other things in the Q&A. Just to let you know, I have no financial disclosures um, when we talk about this or conflicts of interest. Let's talk about human brain development. As John already said, the brain's a remarkable organ. Um, it controls the complex activities which define us as individuals, define us as a society. Uh, the brain is not a static organ. It never fully develops because it's constantly changing in terms of the architecture. It is reshaped by the experiences that occur in our lives. Um, to put it quite simply, we are our brains and our brains are us. So when we talk about different issues like we will today with depression and obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as treatments, it's just really impossible to understand health or mental illness without understanding the workings of our brain. And I'm gonna to try to give you some examples to kind of underline and underscore that, that truism. Brain health is mental health. We talk about mental health all the time, but it'd be equally uh, logical to say brain health we all experience mental distress. And I think over the past year, perhaps more than uh, other years. The brain's response to that stress or to a significant life event. Uh, we've all had life events and that could change how our brains function. When we talk about mental disorders, that's when the brain is not able to cope with the level of stress in the environment or going on. And this can lead to significant problems. This can lead to even disability or at least functional impairment in daily life. 
But when we talk about mental disorders, while I'll be talking about brain a lot today and the biology, I fully understand, and we may talk about in the Q&A, that there are psychological, genetic, uh, and environmental factors that lead to the ultimate uh, development of a mental illness or mental disorder. Neuroscience disorders, I'm going to use that term a little bit more broadly, affect one in four Americans. And you can see some of the common conditions here. This would, one in four means about 76 million Americans. Some of this data is already a couple of years old. So you really wonder where we are right now. This is very expensive for our society and takes a lot of our healthcare spending, which already per, per, per capita is the highest in the world. If you would like to have a more narrow view, taking out perhaps epilepsy out of this and other, it's mental illnesses as commonly constructed still affect one in five Americans, over 50 million Americans. It, you know, even John, when we were talking, it affects our families, our neighbors, our coworkers, uh, it really touches all of our lives. And I suspect we'll talk about that today. So I hope what I'm talking about is not esoteric or, or overly scientific, but is really something that hopefully is meaningful to all of us. I told you I was gonna talk about two illnesses and a treatment today. That's basically, I think all I have time for to give it any justice. And the first is, as we saw in the previous slide, a really common scourge is depression also commonly or, or in referred to in, in, in psychiatry as major depressive disorder. You might not know that depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. 7% of adults in America have experienced major depression in the most recent data, that's uh, from 2018. Again, I wonder if that's still correct or if that's already outdated. And it also can affect children and adolescents. Uh, over in the last 20 years, the risk of depression has increased disproportionately in some populations, in women and especially in adolescents. And we're gonna talk about that because I know there's a lot of parents here today. But even in 2015, 2018, 13% of Americans reported using an antidepressant in the previous 30 days. Patients with depressive disorders, we talk about, we're talking about brain and, and uh, mental health. We also have to understand there's a strong mind-body connection. People with depressive disorders have worse physical health outcomes. And this is expensive. It, it's expensive, especially to employers. This, uh, according to the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill, mental illnesses like depressive disorders being uh, first and foremost, uh, cost $100 billion a year. And that's primarily due to decreased productivity due to missed workdays, over 200 million workdays a year. The most feared complication of depression is suicide. And suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. But as I, I kind of alluded earlier, suicide has increased uh, in certain populations dramatically. When I started my journey as a physician about 20 years ago, uh, compared to today, the risk of a young teenage girl dying from suicide has tripled, tripled, despite the fact that therapy on our, on our phones, in terms of access, in terms of new medicines available or even new technologies are more available and more sophisticated than ever before. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death in people 10 to 34 years of age. Isn't that remarkable? And it's rising. If you look at homicide, which is, you know, there's a lot on TV in terms of if, if there's a gunshot or someone gets killed, and that's a tragic loss, but actually homicide on par, especially over the last 20 years, has been decreasing, whereas suicide is increasing. And again, in young women, in teenagers, it's especially high risk, only really behind accidents. Unfortunately, I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, I, I think of myself as a biological psychiatrist. Uh, I do prescribe medicines and other therapies. Uh, the treatments that we have today are simply not good enough. It's a stark admission, and I know this is being recorded. But the reality is, even though there's some wonderful therapies and therapists and some wonderful medicines that are on the market, over 30 antidepressants that are on the market right now. When you look at large studies, in this case, a government funded study called STAR-D a few years ago, looking at initial response to one antidepressant right here, I, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, initially only 33% of individuals, individuals respond with an introductory common antidepressant. In this case, it was citalopram, also known as Celexa. Very common, generic, very good antidepressant. 
When you start using switching to another antidepressant or more sophisticated, newer antidepressants, the response rate is just better than a coin flip. And when you start getting very complicated, level three interventions are things like lithium augmentation, thyroid supplementation, or level four use of antipsychotics. It's really only two out of three. And of course, when you think of how much time and energy, and as I said earlier, disability, you realize that even in well-controlled, government-run, you know, highly monitored patients, the response rates are still uh, leave a lot to be desired. So why is adequate treatment so difficult to achieve with depression? Well, there's a, there's a variety of issues that I think we could talk about. I, I love this picture, this is not mine, uh, of an iceberg. Yeah, doctors say, or patients will say, well, doc, am I on the right dose? Have I been on it long enough? Maybe just haven't given enough time. But there's a lot of others under the surface. As I said, the medicines for many people simply don't work as well as they could. Many people have side effects to medicine, which makes it difficult, even if medicine's working, to stay on it. And if they go off the medicine too soon, or they don't tolerate a, a sufficient dose, they're not going to have an adequate response. Some people, especially young people, teenagers, college kids, they just have a hard time remembering it. They treat antidepressants like it was an antibiotic. Same way with therapy. They don't stick with it long enough to realize the full benefits or maintain the benefits. The reality is there's been a lot of controversy about the safety of these medicines in young people. We may talk about that today. And the reality is depression oftentimes doesn't run alone. Most people, let's say if you have a medical illness, I'll say like a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. A heart attack doesn't run alone, does it? We know that there are factors like high blood pressure, lifestyle factors like smoking, obesity, family, genetic factors like family history that contribute to the event that we call a heart attack. But the reality is there's other conditions. Similarly with depression, there are other factors leading to it. Family history, anxiety disorders, substance abuse, which make it harder to achieve what is here called adequate treatment. This has real world events. I hope I'm not staying so, so high level that it doesn't have a personal ring to each and every one of us listening today. And again, these are somewhat old numbers. So you're saying, Dr. Stevens, based on these stats, that means there are you know, 14 or more million Americans with depression, only about half ever get treatment. Many because of stigma, which I hope are breaking down today, will not go to their primary care or, or their pastor uh, even their neighbor to ask, to see, do you know anyone who can help me? But so, but even those who receive treatment, only about half are adequately treating, leading these over 10 million that have an inadequate or only partially treated symptoms, which as I showed you before with the suicide statistics, I hope you understand could be deadly. So what's the reality? The reality is in the current situation, this is 2021, there are significant unmet needs. Even after the first treatment, even if you get someone, to me, Menninger, or another psychiatrist or prescriber, the first response might not be a home run. Quite the opposite, it could feel like a strikeout. The likelihood of benefit diminishes with each successive treatment, although people come to me saying, well, I feel like I've been on everything, but is there one more thing? The reality is each successive effort has a lower likelihood of working. And there are some patients out there which remain refractory to all of the common treatments in terms of psychotherapy and medicine. So, and that, that, that doesn't even go, doesn't talk about people who have adverse effects, medicines, headaches, weight gain, GI upset, sexual side effects, and more. So we really need newer, safe, and well-tolerated treatments for these individuals. I'd like to talk to you about something you might not have heard before, or if you've heard about it, don't fully understand it. And that's non-invasive, non-convulsive brain stimulation. Now, when I say, I say brain stimulation, I know what you're thinking. You're going right back to that scene in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where Jack Nicholson is getting ECT without anesthesia, the screaming, what looks like a lobotomy, all those kind of things. Or many other common uh, depictions uh, where this, you know, treatments with electricity seems barbaric. What I'm talking about though is non-invasive non-convulsive stimulation, specifically with magnets. So yes, if it's convulsive with electricity, you see ECT is a potential treatment. There's others that are uh, use um, uh, non-convulsive, but use electricity as well. But I'm gonna focus today on what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or I'm gonna call TMS, which uses a magnet to create an electrical field and does not cause a seizure. That's what convulsive means, a seizure. 
Uh, you know, in the electrical, there's still, ECT is still today, after decades and decades of use, the most single effective treatment for depression. Over 90% of people who get it respond. That's way better than any of the treatments I just showed you, but the stigma um, keeps most people from ever considering it, even though it's so safe and effective. These non-convulsive ones, I've been seeing more and more of these. These are electric, electrical things that people are wrapping around uh, their, their waist and their head. I think for electrical stimulation for either back pain or headache pain, I don't know, John, if you've seen things like that, that's getting very popular. They're, they're powered by like a nine volt battery, not exactly like ECT, but those are still popular too. And they might actually have some efficacy. Um, so there are still use of, of electricity for um, focal you know, headache pain or muscle pain. So I, I haven't ruled by, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but I'm talking about TMS, which is magnets, specifically magnets to certain brain areas to stimulate them. So when we talk about transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS, how does it work? If you haven't heard about it, what is this? Well, sometimes I'll explain it like a high dose MRI. And most of us have had MRIs or experience with family members with MRIs, perhaps to get an image of their back, their knee, uh, you know, their sinuses. Uh, and it gives a really crystal clear picture. But in this case, it's using electricity to create rapidly changing magnetic fields to induce a mild current, very, very shallow below the scalp to the really the outermost areas of the brain. And that excites the neurons and in this fancy term depolarization. It doesn't cause a seizure, but it does excite the neurons temporarily. And this excitation could lead changes in brain circuits and the release of neurotransmitters. A lot of my patients even coming in will talk about chemistry and their neurotransmitters. Many of them think that a, a, you know, a chemical imbalance is their diagnosis. After today, I wanna to let you know that the secret is the currency of the brain is not chemicals as much as it's electricity. Because those neurotransmitters, which are chemicals, create gradients. And the gradients, the changes in how the, where the neurotransmitters are flowing creates electricity. So the real currency of our brain, much like the computer that we're all watching uh, this webinar on today, is the similar, it's electricity. So how does electricity turn into a change in behavior? And you know, this slide kind of goes over that a little bit, but basically, yes, there's this machine that is plugged into the wall or plugged into electricity. And by the use of the paddle, which is right here, which is put on the outside of an individual's head, uh, creates a magnetic field, Tesla, no, not the car, uh, but you know, the, it's named for Tesla. And those rapidly shifting magnetic fields uh, which occur very, very rapidly, induce an electric field. And that induces, that field excites, as I said, depolarizes the neurons of the outer cortex, the gray matter of the brain. And that, for areas, for patients like depression, can have a positive behavioral effect. Quite fortuitously, since TMS was first FDA approved uh, in uh, early 2000s, 2008, the first uh, machine, and many others have been for, for depression, Functional magnetic resonance imaging um, and PET scans, these are very sophisticated scans you may be aware of, showed that areas of the brain, particularly the left prefrontal area, uh, had less metabolism, uh, less use of, of oxygen and blood, and were basically underfunctioning in depressed individuals compared to individuals that weren't depressed. So this comes in at the same time as development of the TMS saying, well, if we could excite that area in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex right here, then maybe we could reverse depression and basically wake up those circuits. And indeed, this is what I see happening at the Menninger Clinic every day. It doesn't mean that the environment, one's psychology, one's family history, one's marital situation doesn't matter. It's just that that underfunctioning of the brain is the final common pathway. So by waking up that area, by getting it to work normally again, that person's able to overcome the depression to address those challenges in their life, in their marriage, in their school, in the family history much more easily than if they were depressed. How is TMS different from ECT? You're maybe still saying this is, this is not clear. Electricity, magnet fields. Well, in ECT, when there's an electric current, that 
electric current goes through the entire brain and that's what causes the seizure. And that's under anesthesia, you don't really see anything, but that's what's happening. TMS, like this individual right here, in the, again, the left frontal side of his brain is right is just happening in that small area, again, very shallow in the surface, getting excited. When you take a psychiatric medicine, and I prescribe many, you take that pill and that goes into your esophagus, your GI system, that medicine is going throughout your body. We hope some is getting into the central nervous system to increase neurotransmitters, but the reality is it's nonspecific. And that's where the side effects come from. TMS, however, is focal. And as you see, this person, he's awake while getting it. Uh, and this is a, an example. A typical course is daily, usually Monday through Friday. Uh, individuals typically have around 30 treatments. And the duration really varies. When the initial FDA approved protocol came out, it was about 36 minutes to receive a treatment. And you would get that 20 to 30 times. Some people a little bit more, some people a little bit less. Uh, Interestingly, sometimes you might say side effects, sometimes it's a little bit painful. It feels like a woodpecker pecking, um, tapping on your brain. But interestingly, much like if you've ever been to a trainer or go to the gym, uh, as some of us, perhaps myself, after a long layoff of COVID, uh, it's a little bit more painful in the beginning after you're getting it. Nothing that a pain that you couldn't deal with, but then afterwards you get used to it. And I have people very routinely who are getting TMS that fall asleep while getting it. Uh, or just listen to their music. And, but the protocols and the technology over the last 10 years have developed so rapidly, it's, it's really quite incredible. So I said 36 minutes for one treatment, you get about 30 of those. At Menninger, we now have that down to 19 minutes. But I have a colleague who's doing some really interesting work and there's some new machines that could do one treatment in three minutes. And I, as I talked to this colleague who was in my same residency class, he stacks three treatments together takes 20 minutes and then stacks another three. So I think if my math is correct, he does an entire 30 treatment course in a week. Now that's still investigational, but much like when the new technology develops, whether it's social media from AOL to Snapchat or TikTok, from the first cell phones to the modern day smartphone, I think we're gonna see radical uh, improvements in this innovation. And I hope that's a big takeaway that this treatment if anything like my colleague who could do six treatments in a day, which is basically the same time it would be for one therapy session and people get a response in a week is really, really exciting. The treatments do occur in a monitored setting. I'll show you some pictures of that. And unlike many treatments, um, patients could drive themselves to the treatment and then drive back, go to work, pick up their children, do whatever they want. So it's very, very flexible. But TMS is not just for OCD, it's excuse me, not just for depression. I'd like to tell you about another condition. I think we have a few minutes. I'll move quicker, but um, another debilitating but highly uh, neuroscience condition is obsessive compulsive disorder. If you know anyone with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, again, I think of Jack Nicholson, again, another Jack Nicholson movie, this time in a good way of, is it uh, as good as it gets? And there's many other depictions of people with obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a common but potentially disabling psychiatric condition that affects about two to 3% of the population. I think most of you know what OCD, we use this term, it kind of has entered the popular vernacular of, you know, especially with COVID being obsessive about cleaning, obsessive about wiping things down or your hygiene. But for these individuals, they might can have intrusive disturbing thoughts and then the compulsions, which are the ritualized behavior to neutralize those obsessive thoughts. These thoughts might be contamination, fear of committing inappropriate acts, uh, need for symmetry or ordery or just right behaviors. I remember in that, that one movie, as good as it gets, opening the doorknob the right way, counting, sometimes hoarding behaviors. The most common age for onset is actually in youth. And many of my patients with OCD are prepubescent, oftentimes boys or teenagers. Again, boys a little bit more than girls. Again, OCD, while it could have genetic underpinnings, environmental triggers, um, psychological um, facets, is ultimately a brain disease uh, related to, uh, relating to uh, circuits in the basal ganglia, 
that go into the orbital frontal regions, the anterior cingulate, and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. I'm not going to ask you to remember that, but uh, again, go to the exhibit next week at the Health Science Museum. They'll show you these, you know, get this slide, bring it there. They'll show you all that on a nice real life brain. What I wanted to say, which is so interesting to me about OCD is, I told you OCD has many different manifestations, is the pattern of activity in the brain differs based on the types of obsessions you have. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So here's some of the connections I just, I raced through, um, but let me just go to this one. So the circuits, if someone comes to my office with hand washing, again, we call hand washing or checking or hoarding, it's all OCD. And if I was or, uh, recommending a therapy, which is typically exposure and response prevention, or if I recommended a medicine, which might be Prozac or Luvox or Paxil, I would not change the medicine or the therapy recommendation based on the type of, o uh, of OCD. But I think now that we're seeing this new, new literature showing that the hand washing is related to different areas of the brain than checking or hoarding is really, really interesting. So if you're saying, well, Dr. Stevens, if you're using this TMS model, then where you use the TMS machine, where you place it would be different for the type of OCD. And indeed, that's exactly what we're, we're, we're seeing. Now, the OCD is these are deeper areas of the brain than the, as you see, and that some of those are hard to get at with the TMS currently. But again, technology is improving. There is a deep TMS uh, machine that goes slightly deeper, that has been FDA approved for OCD. And uh, it's just really exciting. This is really linking, if you're following me, what we're seeing in the brain to the treatment. And so often when you think of psychotherapy, you think of medicine, it's really kind of just one size fits all. And that's where personalized medicine and precision medicine like this is so exciting for me as a psychiatrist uh, through the second half or of my career. Yes, I just this points out that cognitive behavioral therapy, the exposure response prevention, can address those cognitive distortions and decrease anxiety. It's a wonderful form of therapy. Medicines that increase serotonin can also improve obsessions, compulsions, and anxiety. But again, the TMS is, is a space to watch, specifically if we can if we can target specific areas based on the type of OCD. Here's a picture of uh, our brain stimulation suite. This is Dr. Purry and Dr. Wu uh, providing uh, TMS right now. This is the machine uh, to area. This would be in the depression, air, uh, looking for someone with depression and co correlating where they're exciting to the area of the brain based on, it looks like this patient already had an MRI done. So specifically her area. And she's awake. She can converse with the doctors. Uh, what they don't always show is many young people, especially like to listen to their favorite tunes while this is going on. And it's a, a wholly different kind of psychiatry, an interventional psychiatry that a lot of people are not aware of. And certainly nothing like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, if I could just editorialize for a second. So we have TMS approved for major depressive disorder and OCD, and actually very recently for uh, cigarette cessation. Tobacco use while well, decreasing still claims far too many lives from lung cancer and heart disease. And again, but addiction is also not a moral weakness or a character flaw, but in many cases is a brain illness. And many folks, uh, I, had, I was asking someone the other day about their family history of mental illness and addiction. And they said, well, Dr. Stevens, uh, mental illness doesn't run in the family, it gallops. It took me a second to get it, but then I realized what they, what they meant is that Problems with alcohol was great grandma's problem, mom, you know, grandma's problem, mom's problem, and my problem, they were trying to say. So that's very exciting. And there's a positive studies in children for depression. Pediatric depression is something I suspect we'll talk about. Some of the antidepressants for children have safety concerns uh, that worry a lot of parents in terms of black box warnings on increased suicidality. A few years ago, that got a lot of pu publicity. There are other tough to treat depressions in psychiatry like bipolar depression, schizophrenia, trauma, I think is a very exciting area for TMS, uh, potentially ADHD, autism would be interesting. There's another condition where we call something one thing, but I think autism has is the final common pathway for many uh, genetic and environmental causes. 
pain, which is pain is also a brain condition. We don't experience pain at the tissue site. We experience it here. And as we know that there's a scourge right now of using pain medicines, particularly narcotics in our country, costing tens of thousands of lives. So we need new and better treatments there. And also neurologic illnesses. Again, I'm focusing on the psychiatric, but I don't want to take out, there is no real, no real hard and firm uh, border between the psychiatric and the neurologic. So TMS, just to, to wrap it up, uh, it's just one of potentially many treatment alternatives to psychotherapy, to medications. It's non-invasive. It does not cause a seizure. I like, uh, what particularly excites me about it, its effects are local and does not affect other organ systems. Uh, pregnant women can get this, where pregnant women might be um, disinclined to stay on medicines during pregnancy, but uh, peripartum and postpartum depression are also um, very much on my mind. And, is, and I, in my experience and anecdotally here at Menninger, the rates of that have increased dramatically. Young mothers have been disproportionately affected uh, during the pandemic, um, caring for their ch new child, oftentimes trying to be the educator of a child that was home, getting virtual school. Uh, so we wanna be careful, uh, we wanna be mindful of that population. TMS is very well tolerated. Uh, like medicines or psychotherapy, it's not rapid. There's no magic fix here. It does take time, although I think the technology will increase. Um, coming to a place where it's done and then leaving can be time intensive, but overall, um, I think it's quite promising. I'm presenting this, but there are a lot of people who are doing this. There's a team of wonderful doctors and nurses um, that walk patients through this, that provide this. I want to acknowledge their effort in helping me to um, put together this talk. It looks like we're going to have some time to, to discuss a lot of different issues, but I hope it's stimul stimulating to the audience. And with that, um, if you need to reach me, it's in there. If this is interesting or if there's uh, something that the Menninger Clinic can do to be helpful, pull that and that's um, my direct line and my email. And that'll be there, I think, um, on the website. Great. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Stevens. That was, uh, that was really fascinating. I, 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 uh, I'm, I, I learned things that I didn't even know about before. Um, so let me let me start. We've got a couple of questions in chat, but I'm going to start sure. with some, some kind of higher level questions. And yeah. The first is really more of a, of a statement. Um, one of the, the statistics you you provided was one in four Americans has uh, I think a, a mental health challenge um, or depression, um, and that was old data. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have any data, new data on that, and, and we don't either. But um, what I found is is being here at the Health Museum and and talking with hundreds of people outside yeah. of the health museum over this past year is literally every single person I talk to talks about their mental health. Um, and it's everything from, um, there's a term that's used languishing. Some people feel like we're languishing right mm -hmm. now. Other people have severe depression um, because of, of this COVID situation we're in. Um, but um, you know, to, to me, it, it's gotta be significantly higher um, and, and what's even more important is that we're all talking about mental health and the, the stigma around mental health is being reduced uh, each day that goes by as we're able to talk about it some more. So um, my question, uh, and I'm gonna start yeah. with the, the more traditional therapies and when it comes to medicine, uh, medications and for children, um, at what age could a child potentially be put on some kind of a medication related to, to, to mental health? Well, it could depend not only um you know, just on the age, but also on the condition. So there are some children that are elementary school or even preschool with conditions that are very treatable with medicine and disruptive behavior disorders, specifically one that many people are going to be familiar with, which is called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. This is the most common neurobehavioral disorder in children, it affects five to 8% of the population. Uh, the ones that are particularly hyperactive and impulsive tend to get picked up earlier especially if they're getting kicked out of the classroom in the principal's office or getting some kind of disciplinary issue or impulsive with other children. The inattentive ones, the ones that are having trouble focusing, organizing, those can go out usually a little bit later in life, but will find me eight, 10, hopefully not much later than that because basically they've been tested, they're brilliant, but in class they're lost. They procrastinate assignments, they're losing assignments, they're not turning them in. Um, Typically things like anxiety are also around this kind of, you know, preteen age can 
uh, you know, separation anxiety. I'm seeing a lot of that school avoidance now. It's very hard to go back to school when that pattern of being at home with mom or dad has, has set in. So I'm seeing a lot of school phobia. And then when you start seeing depression, usually, although not always, you're talking about teenage after puberty. That's when that usually manifests. So I see a lot of little ones in my office and um, usually the parents don't want to be there or they, the pediatrician took a crack at trying to do the ADHD management. But I've had some as, as old as, as young as, as uh, four. Then again, I have patients up in their 90s as well who are sometimes the same issues. So um, as a child psychiatrist, I really view myself as a generalist treating the population no matter what the age. And uh, I think it's a personal decision for families, but you know, if the med- these, some of these medicines like for ADHD are really, really safe and really, really effective despite all what you've heard out there in the popular so, press. So, so, so let me, that, that's a great uh, um, segue into the, the follow-up question okay. is um, there are a lot of side effects to some of these medications. And, and as a parent, I have four children myself and actually yeah. I've had children on some of the medication. Um, there's a lot of trepidation uh, around that, um, especially when you, when some of the side effects, I think, or some of them are potentially suicidal thoughts. Um, in any, any kind of feedback for, for parents regarding that? Yeah, so a few years ago, the black box warning from the FDA regarding potential increased risk of suicidality in teens on these antidepressants, and it's since been expanded to actually 24 and younger, um, created a lot of chill in the community, specifically not so much for psychiatrists who already were aware of this and take this into account, but primary care physicians who actually prescribe SSRIs, those are the, that's the term, antidepressants, for teens for depression far more often because there's just simply more pediatricians out there than there are child psychiatrists. The rate, the risk of, of that increased suicidality is minimal. And you, I think, can be completely avoided in terms of that concern with a good conversation about the risks, benefit, and alternatives with the family involving the teenager, if it's a teenager, and also having other supports like therapy. If it's just a prescription, nothing else attached to it, then I think it's, it's more dangerous. I also think there's a couple of things, but if you don't mind me saying, John, there's other ways of, of, of actually being more precise. I talked about precision psychiatry and personalized medicine. There are a lot of new advances in genetics, which I didn't get to today, which can allow me to check a child's genetics to understand their personal metabolism of medicines before ever prescribing. So we have a roadmap on how to prescribe for that individual's metabolism, seeing what medicines might work better or might might be more likely to cause a side effect. It's not 100%, it's not black and white, this is the best, you know, some magic thing, this is the only medicine, but it gives odds, probabilities. And that for some families is very helpful. And again, I don't know if your audience, if a lot of people even have heard of that, it's probably changed since your children were young yeah. because it's really basically in the last five years that it's become, the technology has been ready for prime time. Wow, Dr. Stevens, you're, you're talking about my age. Yes, my children are my children. <laughs> and, and yes, um, that was not around when my kids were young. Uh, so playing with you there. Okay, so changing topic a little bit. And really, this is what you focus your presentation on. And I'm going to use a word that you use. It's technology. Um, you know, technology is, is at the forefront of healthcare. Um, and I use the word technology holistically and healthcare holistically, right? Um, and it's interesting that you refer to a treatment for, uh, for depression and OCD right. as to technology, which is right. what it is, TMS. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. So um, I guess um, my, my first question is, we know, we know Menninger provides treatments with TMS, correct? Correct. Okay. So are there other uh, organizations, and we don't have to name them necessarily, in, in Houston that, that are doing treatments with TMS? Absolutely. And it's uh, easily accessed by Google searches. There's uh, societies, which will show reputable providers that are, are, are in these kind of brain stimulation societies. Okay. So you can make it more uh, convenient uh, for you. And, and I think it is about technology. And, I, and that's basically, it's not just TMS. It's really understanding that there are new technologies that might have kept people away from mental health or they access mental health earlier in their life and are, are you know, I really look at it like there's a whole new third era of psychiatry that I'm excited to be in. The first era probably began with Dr. Freud and the interpretation yep. of dreams well over hundred years ago and psychotherapy. To me, the second era began about the 1980s, likely with Prozac. There were other medicines before Prozac, but that really 
was a whole new generation now of medicines of, that were safe and effective. Yep. And then I was saying around, you know, 2000s, probably around the 2010, the medicines, the new medicines really have stalled. The pipeline has not yielded major advances, but there's these new technologies in genetics, brain stimulation, um, intravenous ketamine is very, very interesting. And who knows, it could even be psychedelics in the next five or so years, uh, along, combining that with medicine, combining that with therapy in ways that would, again, even in, uh, you know, in early in my career would have been unthinkable. And that's yep. just so, so exciting. Well, that, that's great. It's good to hear that here at the Health Museum, we are focused on, on mental health. That is a big component of health and wellness. And so um, you give me some thoughts of, of, of exhibits and webinars we can have in the future. Um, back to TMS. So if, if I'm considering exploring uh, TMS as a treatment, um, I know there are other organizations that, that do it. And, but of course, Menninger, as I said earlier, is, is one of the, the best in the United States. Um, what kind of questions would I, would I, should I be asking of, of an organization that I may be talking to about doing a, a TMS treatment? Well, I mean, some of it is the logistics. Can you, you know, literally go five times a week and you want to really have some time to do to get about those 30 treatments in there. So if you have a two week uh, trip somewhere because you haven't traveled in a year and a half, um, maybe that now is not the best time. Then again, if people are really struggling with depression, they're probably not thinking of a major trip right now, John. I mean, that's just the, the practicality. I would in generally say, reach out sooner to at least discuss to see if, if, if it's really for you. There's very few contraindications. Obviously, if you have some kind of metal in your head. Obviously, when you're talking about magnets, that, that's not ideal. But if it's just that you have a bar nose ring, that could be taken out or earrings, things like that. Um, I don't see your bar nose ring, so you're probably okay, John. So these, uh, you know, these are some of the questions you want to talk to Dr. Purry and his team uh, or talk to a provider. Don't, you're not just going to go there to start. You really want to ready, aim, fire, not ready, fire, aim. As is often the case with medicines and psychotherapies, it's people... You know, you really want to start with a good diagnosis to make sure, A, is this depression? Make sure you have a good medical workup, um, that you provide your history to the provider. It's, you know, because just like any technology, if it's used haphazardly, that's when there are more problems as opposed to if it's really precise, if it's personalized. I'm sorry to use these terms over and over, but they're really what now I've, I've these are the mission in my career, which is I realize I can't help everyone and can only help what I could do as one individual but this is the way we're going to help them using technology, using precision interventions and using personalization one person at a time. Um, that, that's, that's my mission. Right. And it, so TMS has been only around for 12 years and it sounds like there are different treatment methods, methodology. You reference a, a friend of yours who's doing it yeah. um, very short bursts in, in, a, in a shorter amount of time, which is fascinating. Um, so it I is, there's some left side using okay. uh, different frequencies. So I've talked about for depression, yeah. this left prefrontal area, uh, prefrontal area is under metabolizing, is under functioning. Think of it almost like a flabby muscle. Of course, the brain's not muscle, mm -hmm. but think of it that. But for anxiety, the right prefrontal area is generally overexcited. So I mean, people with anxiety disorders, you want to use a different frequency of the machine to actually calm it down. Uh, so it's very interesting. He's, uh, and, and, you know, he's doing work with uh, uh, individuals, generally uh, people in the military that had traumatic brain injuries to help recover, to stimulate that brain to regrow. It's just phenomenal work. And I think what I'm saying today, if someone watches this in a year or two, I hope will be already well behind the times. And that's exciting for me. Well, you just you just already changed my mind here a little bit. Uh, I have a son with a traumatic brain injury. Um, so I'm going to get the name of the doctor from you <laughs> when we're done. Yeah. Um, that's great. So, uh, so TMS, uh, Another technology that, that we talked about, you talked about, you referenced the, the one floor of a cuckoo's nest and lobotomies yeah. was I think electronic convulsive treatment or something to that effect. Correct. Um, which of course we all had that, that hesitation of thinking of, of the dramatic movies that we've seen with that. But talk a little bit more about that because that is now more mainstream and it's not like it was in the movies, correct? Yeah, I mean, we do in our brain stimulation uh, suite, we, st we still do ECT. Uh, it's wonderfully effective. It's very rapid. It could work in about two weeks. You generally get three treatments. It does involve being under anesthesia, getting a seizure, but you're, you're uh, paralyzed. So there's no shaking. It's not violent. You're not screaming. You're asleep. Uh, here at Menninger, your family could come in and watch it with you. They usually don't come every time because it's a very underwhelming experience. 
you just see someone paralyzed on a table and they get the treatment, um, they recover, and then they go home. They have to be driven home, uh, you know, usually to take a nap. But in as little as oftentimes a few treatments, half a dozen treatments, you see a remarkable improvement in uh, depressive symptoms. Similarly exciting, although not as long lasting and not as evidence based yet, is the use of ketamine. This was, uh, we've been using that intravenously. This is an anesthetic that's been around since the 70s for anesthesia. It's still often used if you have pets and they're going in for treatment. Uh, the veterinarians still use ketamine very often. Uh, yes, it had been abused as, as a substance, so people are aware of that. But in a highly controlled low dose environment, people that are very depressed and suicidal in just one or two infusions, which only last uh, a half an hour, can find instant relief, which is really, really helpful for some highly suicidal people that can't wait another day. Um, that's not exactly brain stimulation because it's, it's pharmacology, but uh, it's also very exciting. So these new advances, um, combining these treatments with psychotherapy oftentimes like ketamine, I think is very exciting. And, 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 and refining the older treatments, bringing in the new ones, I think is gonna be really, really exciting in the next five to 10 years. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm going back, uh, question from the audience, uh, two related to TMS. The first one is, how long does TMS treatment potentially help? Once you're done with the treatment, how long does it typically help or last in that patient? I mentioned the ketamine, very, very exciting treatment. The problem with that one is it might only last days or weeks, some, some longer. The TMS seems very durable and that the effect lasts even when you stop it. Now, some people do come back in for, I'm using this colloquially just because of the audience, this is not the same, tune-ups, but you know, to get a, 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 maybe a treatment a week instead of five a week here and there, uh, we have individuals that benefit from that and, and, and choose that. Uh, but the effect is quite durable and is very, very exciting. You don't, generally don't have to keep getting it at that kind of intensity after you've completed the 20 to 30 treatments. Okay. Let's see here. Can you, uh, so, so the question is, how do you, can you explain the treatment? So you kind of showed us the pictures. I think you talked about a little bit, but, mm -hmm. but, but, but you know, maybe a, a little bit more detail of um, maybe the whole, the total time um, from when you get to the, to the clinic to when you yeah. leave and a little bit more about the, the actual treatment itself. So the first session's the longest. Uh, it goes over your history. It goes over if you're a candidate or not, and then the measurements to find the exact area that's going to be stimulated. And, that's, and that is measured using instruments, using scientific instruments, um, so that you're exciting the, the area of the brain that we want to and nothing else. That's what that it's, remember I said in that one slide, it's focal. We're not just exciting the whole brain. And in future sessions, uh, right now it's a 19 minute protocol. So you get there, uh, take out your earrings, you sit down and for the second and second through the 30th treatment. Um, they have a mask, as you saw in that one picture, I could show it again, where they've already marked off the area that they want. So you put on the mat, you know, you put on the, excuse me, the, not the mask, but the kind of little cap, and then they will uh, excite that same area. So it's much faster, lasts about 19 minutes in our current protocol. Again, that could change uh, in years ahead, and then you're out about your day. Sure. And when that, so it's, the treatments have a remarkable similarity once you get going. And most people just listen to music and, and take a 19 minute kind of just cat nap actually after the first few sessions, it's quite remarkable. Really fascinating, it's, really. It, uh, it is, it's, I mean, John, I'll invite you over. It's, uh, it, it's, it's quite boring. Um, all you can hear is some sure. clicking of the machine. And uh, so you wear a little earbuds, so it's clicking, um, you, you, you know, as it's, uh, the, you know, that's how our machine is. Some are apparently quieter, some are louder. Um, there's about eight or nine machines that have been FDA approved on the market. So there's different machines. And that's what I like. It's the space. Okay. It's, it's, it's just like the cell phones in the early days. There's a, a lot of different kinds. It's, you know, competition and time and working and results will determine which ones are the dominant ones. Right now, there is no iPhone machine yet uh, or something like that. There's a lot of competition and a lot of different protocols, which I find very exciting. But you know, you never know. It's like new technologies coming up every day, and, and iPhones are doing more and more. So, who knows? Uh, okay. uh, another question related to, to TMS. Uh, the question is about BPD. I'm so, assuming it's bipolar disorder. Um, is there efficacy with TMS related to bipolar disorder? I think I your question you is probably earlier. talking about borderline personality disorder. Oh, uh, border. Sorry. And, and I and whoever your your the questioner is, I think that's really astute because personality disorders. I, frankly, because of their name, 
Um, yes, they are a way of interacting with the world, a way of seeing the world that are, are long lasting. Are, it's still in my mind, fit within these, um, these brain disorders. It's not a character flaw, even though it sounds like it is when you hear a personality disorder, and it's not a lifelong sentence if this is the way you're gonna have. Many people in Menninger had a diet personality disorder diagnosis and with the right kind of treatments, psychotherapy, medicines, and otherwise, they uh, do better. Right now, there's not a specific protocol for BPD. However, just like I mentioned that whole analogy about heart attacks and, and having things go along with it, borderline personality disorder rarely runs alone, oftentimes runs along with a mood disorder, anxiety disorder, self-injurious behavior, and substance use, amongst others, and trauma. So my response would be, while it might not treat the BPD, that BPD uh, borderline personality disorder might not look as severe if the depression, anxiety is treated, if the uh, person is getting good addiction treatment and is not on substances of abuse, or if their traumas were adequately treated. So I think it can have a usage. And if that's something you're thinking about, please consider it. I've seen a lot of people who were thought to have a personality disorder and have been thrown around and then they get their depression treated and somehow, hmm, mysteriously, that personality disorder evaporates. In some cases, it could just be a manifestation of, of depression. You're more irritable, you're more on edge, you're not getting along with people as much, you're self-destructive. A lot of those symptoms that we see in depression are also criteria for borderline personality disorder. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, two questions related to TMS, um, and, and I'm gonna combine them. Uh, one, is it is it like neurofeedback, and is it safer than getting an x-ray? Um, it's different from neurofeedback. That's something different, and I see what our time, it, it, yeah. it is different because it's using magnetic fields. It's closer to an MRI. So I would say it is actually uh, safer than an x-ray because x-rays, especially a lot of them, not just a single one, but that's, that's an, involving things that can change your, your DNA um, with x-rays. So the, the MRI does not do that. There is a rare risk of a seizure. It's extremely rare of causing one. It's the same risk that a medicine, a medicine for depression could cause a seizure, which actually happens. It's rare, uh, but that could happen. And that's why it should be done. I mean, I would order a TMS machine. They're 50 to $100,000. So I don't think people would do this. Uh, to your home and kind of like, okay, I'm going to have this to start my day. It's not, you do have to go somewhere, but um, there are risks and it should be medically supervised. And that's, we have the wonderful team of doctors and nurses you saw at the end. Okay. Um, and then the last question, because I know we're running out of time here is, is related to addiction. And I know you talked yeah. about addiction a little bit and addiction, there are so many different types of addictions, but um, one of the questions was, is TMS um, available for addiction? And I believe it is. But it, it maybe, and I know we don't have very much time, but from an addiction perspective, what are the, the best treatment options, the newest, maybe the newest, latest, greatest treatment options potentially for addiction? Yeah, first of all, uh, I love the question. I think addictions oftentimes get separated from mental health as mm -hmm. it's something different and then get hived off and into a model where it's, it's basically uh, a 12 step, kind of get to zero. But we know there's a lot of different approaches uh, to addiction, including harm reduction. And there are medicines that have been approved that were not around at the beginning of my career for alcohol use, for opioid use disorder. Um, I'm thinking of naltrexone uh, for those, for some uh, buprenorphine or suboxone for opiates. And this is, John, I can't tell you affecting so many people right now, but I'm very excited about TMS. Addiction involves an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. That's really deep. And right now a little bit too hard for TMS to get to, because I said it's, it, TMS works on the surface structures, but, Again, it's just technology. I think we could eventually get there. I'm really excited that one of the makers was approved for uh, tobacco cessation, nicotine addiction. And that's really, really exciting because now you're getting, you could see you're getting closer to alcohol, potentially cannabis use disorders, opioid use disorders, potentially using TMS. So um, it, it's getting closer more all the time. And, and again, I'm very excited about it. Uh, not only the pharmacologic, still using, uh, the 12 step and, and other um, kind of, uh, you know, peer support recovery, people helping people, doesn't have to be always physicians, but I think there's a lot that the medical field can and should do to address this issue. Because in many cases, obviously with opioids, in part, the medical field created the issue and, and there's a responsibility to try to undo it with, the, with new technologies. And I've heard with uh, treatments, especially addiction treatments and others, it's not just one thing that's going to work. It's a combination of things that really can help um, a potential uh, person with, with uh, addiction. Yes, the more, the more uh, 
areas of leverage, the better. Family, sure. technology, yeah. peer support, environment. Yeah. It's all it all goes into that. It's a complicated question. Probably another, yeah, another, another installment. Great. Well, listen, uh, we are about at time. Dr. Stevens, um, this was fascinating. I, I, I really appreciate your time. I'm really excited about our partnership. Um, thank you for being here. Um, uh, for all of our, our guests on here, as Dr. Stevens mentioned, we are opening up a new exhibit in about a week, all about the brain. Um, and that's why we're having these conversations. So um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. I hope everybody has a, a great day.